Hebrews 11. Now, faith is the reality of what is hoped for, the proof of what is not seen. For by it, our ancestors won God's approval. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the Word of God, so that what is seen was made from things that are not visible. By faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain did. By faith, he was approved as a righteous man, because God approved his gifts. And even though he is dead, he still speaks through his faith. By faith, Enoch was taken away, and so he did not experience death. He was not to be found because God took him away. For before he was taken away, he was approved as one who pleased God. Now, without faith, it is impossible to please God, since the one who draws near to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. By faith, Noah, after he was warned about what was not yet seen and motivated by godly fear, built an ark to deliver his family. By faith, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. By faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed and set out for a place that he was going to receive as an inheritance. He went out even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he stayed as a foreigner in the land of promise, living in tents as did Isaac and Jacob, co-heirs of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. By faith, even Sarah herself, when she was unable to have children, received power to conceive offspring, even though she was past the age, since she considered that the one who had promised was faithful. Therefore, from one man, in fact, from one as good as dead, came offspring as numerous as the stars of the sky and as innumerable as the grains of sand along the seashore. These all died in faith, although they had not received the things that were promised. But they saw them from a distance, greeted them, and confessed that they were foreigners and temporary residents on earth. Now, those who say such things make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they were thinking about where they came from, they would have had an opportunity to return. But they now desire a better place, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for He has prepared a city for them. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. He received the promises, and yet he was offering his one and only son to the one to whom it had been said, your offspring will be called through Isaac. He considered God to be able even to raise someone from the dead. Therefore, he received him back, figuratively speaking, by faith. Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph, and he worshipped, leaning on the top of his staff. By faith, Joseph, as he was nearing the end of his life, mentioned the exodus of the Israelites and gave instructions concerning his bones. By faith, Moses, after he was born, was hidden by his parents for three months because they saw that the child was beautiful and they didn't fear the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter and chose to suffer with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasure of sin. For he considered reproach for the sake of Christ to be greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt since he was looking ahead to the reward. By faith, he left Egypt behind, not being afraid of the king's anger. For Moses persevered as one who sees him who is invisible. By faith, he instituted the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood, so that the destroyer of the firstborn might not touch the Israelites. By faith, they crossed the Red Sea as though they were on dry land. When the Egyptians attempted this, they were drowned. 
By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after being marched around by the Israelites for seven days. By faith, Rahab, the prostitute, welcomed the spies in peace and didn't perish with those who disobeyed. What more can I say? Time is too short for me to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets, who by faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched the raging of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, gained strength and weakness, became mighty in battle, and put foreign armies to flight. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Other people were tortured, not accepting release, so that they might gain a better resurrection. Others experienced mockings and scourgings, as well as bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawed in two. They died by the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins, goatskins, destitute, afflicted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and on mountains, hiding in caves and holes in the ground. All these were approved through their faith, but they did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us, so that they would not be made perfect without us. Hebrews 12 Therefore, since we also have such a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the source and perfecter of our faith. For the joy that lay before Him, He endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, so that you won't grow weary and give up. In struggling against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood, and you have forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons. My son, do not take the Lord's discipline lightly, or lose heart when you are reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and punishes every son he receives. Endure sufferings as discipline. God is dealing with you as sons. For what son is there that a father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, which all receive, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Furthermore, we had human fathers discipline us and we respected them. Shouldn't we submit even more to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time based on what seemed good to them, but He does it for our benefit so that we can share His holiness. No discipline seems enjoyable at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Therefore, strengthen your tired hands and weakened knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated but healed instead. Pursue peace with everyone and holiness. Without it, no one will see the Lord. Make sure that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no root of bitterness springs up, causing trouble and defiling many. And make sure that there isn't any immoral or irreverent person like Esau who sold his birthright in exchange for a single meal. For you know that later, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, even though he sought it with tears because he didn't find any opportunity for repentance. For you have not come to what could be touched, to a blazing fire, to darkness, gloom, and storm, to the blast of a trumpet and the sound of words. Those who heard it begged that not another word be spoken to them, for they could not bear what was commanded. 
Even if an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned. The appearance was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. Instead, you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to myriads of angels, a festive gathering, to the assembly of the firstborn, whose names have been written in heaven, to a judge who is God of all, to the spirits of righteous people made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood, which says better things than the blood of Abel. See to it that you do not reject the one who speaks. For if they did not escape when they rejected him, who warned them on earth, even less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven. His voice shook the earth at that time, but now he has promised. Yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. This expression, yet once more, indicates the removal of what can be shaken, that is, created things, so that what is not shaken might remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful. By it, we may serve God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Hebrews 13 Let brotherly love continue. Don't neglect to show hospitality, for by doing this, some have welcomed angels as guests without knowing it. Remember those in prison as though you were in prison with them and the mistreated as though you yourselves were suffering bodily. Marriage is to be honored by all and the marriage bed kept undefiled because God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterers. Keep your life free from the love of money. Be satisfied with what you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you or abandon you. Therefore, we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Remember your leaders who have spoken God's words to you. As you carefully observe the outcome of their lives, imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday today and forever. Don't be led astray by various kinds of strange teachings, for it is good for the heart to be established by grace and not by food regulation, since those who observe them have not benefited. We have an altar from which those who worship at the tabernacle do not have a right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the most holy place by the high priest as a sin offering are burned outside the camp. Therefore, Jesus also suffered outside the gate so that he might sanctify the people by his own blood. Let us then go to him outside the camp, bearing his disgrace. For we do not have an enduring city here. Instead, we seek the one to come. Therefore, through him, let us continually offer up to God a sacrifice of praise, that is, the fruit of lips that confess his name. Don't neglect to do what is good and to share, for God is pleased with such sacrifices. Obey your leaders and submit to them, since they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account so that they can do this with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. Pray for us, for we are convinced that we have a clear conscience, wanting to conduct ourselves honorably in everything. And I urge you all the more to pray that I may be restored to you very soon. Now, may the God of peace, who brought up from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of our sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, equip you with everything good to do His will, working in us what is pleasing in His sight, through Christ Jesus, to whom be the glory forever and ever. 
Amen. Brothers and sisters, I urge you to receive this message of exhortation, for I have written to you briefly. Be aware that our brother Timothy has been released. If he comes soon enough, he will be with me when I see you. Greet all your leaders and all the saints. Those who are from Italy send you greetings. Grace be with you all. Okay, welcome back. This is Hebrews. I did a little thing different, but as I was reading this book, I felt as though it needed to be heard sort of all at once without me. So there doesn't seem to be a consensus on who wrote this book, but what a great book. Such a different message. Jesus, a high priest, more worthy than Moses. All the priests that have ever been known by the Hebrews, every single one, they have been required to make an atonement sacrifice, not only for the congregation, but for themselves. Because it was known, look, man, we know you're a sinner just like us, no worries. However, Jesus, also being tempted, did not fall to the sin. So what atonement sacrifice is required for him? He possessed the self-control needed to avoid the temptation, and he was blessed for it. As a result, God raised him up from the dead and said, Booyakashala! This makes Jesus familiar with temptation, not a victim of it. We call this credibility. And this is what we need in a priest, a credible priest. Therefore, this book says Jesus is worthy as a high priest. And because of all of these things, we should approach Jesus and the throne of grace and mercy with boldness. Now, what do you think that looks like? I mean, given everything that we have read and all the things that we understand, what does a bold Christian look like? Now, to Melchizedek, the high priest of Salem, consider what this author is explaining. Obviously, they would need to have an understanding, at least some sort of a functional understanding of what was written about Melchizedek back in Genesis. That being said, there's very little written about him. But we knew that he was a priest that understood who Hashem God was. And this priest blessed Abraham. In fact, Abraham ignores kings to honor this priest. To this priest, Jesus has his priestship. I don't know why Melchizedek even needs to be considered. But Jesus is holy, innocent, undefiled, as was this guy. This author speaks to the credibility of Jesus. Old Covenant, New Covenant, Messiah. The history of the Jews is sort of illustrated. There's the first covenant, the prophets, the laws. And then, of course, there are the events that took place during Jesus' life. And this whole story all points to the Old Testament indicators, but Jesus being a priest himself doesn't make an atonement for his own sins. He himself is the atonement for all of the sins. Okay. Yet, despite all the effort the author puts in making the connections, look at the proof, this connects here and this connects here. This story is still, it's about faith. There is a considerable amount of time that is spent describing faith, what it looks like, who had it, the effects of it. We know that we have the permission to enter the throne of grace with boldness. And Jesus says our faith need only be as big as a mustard seed, which really is very small. So, does a person pray boldly for greater faith? Think about it. You have to believe in something. I believe I'm a basketball player. So imagine all the effort I'm going to put in to try to be a basketball player. And my hope would be, I don't know, a college scholarship or playing for the NBA. <laughs> Nevertheless, this hope that I have and the confidence that I have in my belief, it sort of pushes me to kind of go through the grueling misery and to endure all the training that is going to be required. Imagine if it comes to tryouts and it, I'm just not good enough. What does that do 
to my faith and my whole system of belief that I could make it. Seems like it would be crushed. So, isn't there an enormous risk in making these sorts of promises? They're so enormous, these promises. And it begins from the first book of the gospel. It continues all the way to these letters. We are promised that if we place our faith in God, that we will not be made fools for it. We will certainly be made fun of because of it, but God won't make us fools. And we won't experience a loss that is so earth-shattering that we lose this faith. And this is the reason for our hope. So it's an enormous risk, but I don't know what is so stupid about that. In fact, I... I think it's wonderful. This was a great book. I hope that you enjoyed it. Thank you for listening. The NQE is out.